I'm Spencer Mazik, and joining me now is lawyer turned world traveling blogger Jody Edinburgh. Her blog is called Legal Nomads, and she's also the author of the Food Traveler's Handbook. Welcome, Jody. It's so good of you to join us in New York City today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, I want to begin with law school. You went to school in Montreal, which is where you're from. That's so, right. what were your reasons for going to law school? My reason is actually not a really legitimate reason. Someone bet me I couldn't get into law school, and um, <laughs> it's probably not the reason everyone would expect. Uh, but basically, what happened was I was straight out of Cégep, which is grade 12 and 13 in Quebec. And someone had asked me, you know, I want to apply to law school. We were kind of competitive with our grades growing up. And they said, you know, I bet you can't get in. It was the day before the applications were due. I kind of scrawled off a cover letter really quickly um, and sent it in. And I got in and they basically took a few of us, not many, and put them with everyone else. So I was quite young. I was 19 when I started. Everyone else was the usual undergrad first and then started law school. So you got in on a bet, but <laughs> why did you decide to ultimately go? Well, to be fair, it's good to mention that Canadian tuition is actually quite low compared to American tuition. So it was about 1600 a semester for me um, at McGill, and I, there wasn't anything else I was aching to do, to be honest. Had there been, I probably would have chosen a different path, but I went with this, I got in, and I figured, why not? I was offered an entry scholarship, and I just went with it. There's, there's nothing wrong about furthering your education, so... No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Could be worse educations to obtain. Exactly. So where did you go after you graduated from law school? Well, I summered in New York City uh, during law school and actually because they didn't realize I had kind of flown in th under the radar without the undergraduate degree, uh, they were confused about how young I was and I used that kind of leverage to get myself an extension on my offer date. So instead of starting right away after law school, I pushed it back. Um, I did a year in France studying intellectual property law in Europe and then I worked in South America in sustainable development um, for about a year and then came back to start in 2003. So my first job out of law school was in New York City. Um, I started at Paul Weiss here. And so what was your experience like at Paul Weiss and then also at Davis and Gilbert, which is where you went after sure. Paul Weiss? Both were hardworking. I mean, talk to any corporate lawyer or any lawyer in the city and in most cities, you work very hard. You know, it's not your own schedule, but I learned a lot. I'm very grateful for the training I got. I'm grateful for the people that mentored me in both cases. I remember though when I started, because I had none of that benefit of sort of life experience or business experience, I remember starting with a partner um, at Paul Weiss when I first got there and I, he was starting on an IPO. That was the first thing that I was working on and I remember saying, you know, I get the IP part, but the O, it's throwing me off a little. And he was like, you have to be kidding me. So I was joking, but of course he was not amused at all. Uh, it was kind of trial Didn't by fire. Didn't have much of a no, sense of humor he there. He did, he does, but I think he just went like, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, at Davis and Gilbert, you know, also great people. And I really enjoyed it. I did advertising law, new media stuff, which was wonderful because it was a type of work, doing, working in technology and in social media is what I do now as part of my blog as well. So it was a nice precursor to that. Uh, but when I did give notice, someone made the joke that on my wall was all these photos blown up of where I had been and not my degrees. And they said, where are your degrees? And I said, they're under my bed. Yeah. And they said, we should have known you weren't going to stay put. <laughs> well, when you left practice in 2008, did you know then that you wouldn't return indefinitely or no. forever? I thought I'd be going for a year around the world. My intention was not quit my job and become a travel and food writer. It just really kind of organically came into this new career. And I just decided when I started receiving these opportunities to do freelance work uh, and other things when, when I started writing more and more about food and the history of food, I just went with it and I figured, you know, I'm still admitted to practice in New York State. I pay up my dues every two years and what's the worst case? I go back to practice. That's certainly not a worst case scenario. You know, it's, it's better than most people have the opportunity to do. And I want to back up for just a second. You said sure. you took a year off to travel. How much did you save up for that, that <laughs> excursion away from law? So on the side, I've got like a really big world travel resources page and it, it's divided into budgets for different areas of the world and for around the world. Most people budget anywhere from 10 to 20,000 for one year of around the world travel. I came in at around 12 uh, for my first year and I'd saved enough to do that twice, uh, to do two years to have a buffer basically. If I did the one year around the world, came back, was trying to figure out what to do next, I thought what I would do is probably get either in-house counsel work or do some sort of publicly, public advocacy or non-profit work. Um, certainly didn't expect it to be five years later and still doing <laughs> what I'm doing. Well, but the, the, I guess one of the questions that I have here for sure. you is, uh, was there anything from your childhood that <laughs> cultivated or created an interest in long-term travel? 
I think, well, the, what, what did cultivate the idea of storytelling is that my mom has studied history and, and really is a wonderful storyteller herself. And my father also is a wonderful storyteller. So growing up, you know, at the kitchen table, my parents are split. So each of the tables that I got were really these wonderful opportunities to hear stories and tell stories. And my mother would talk about world history in this fantastic way, making it almost into a soap opera and engaging my brother and I in, in thinking about stories as a way to really teach people about things in a way that engages them and instead of feeling like it's academic. So when I started writing and kept going with the site and talking about the history of food and how colonization affects the way we eat. It, it's, I think a lot of it does come from that kind of background where words were very important to everyone in my family. So, And you're talking about Legal Nomads, your blog. That's how, correct. how exactly did that come about? I just thought it was a funny name. Um, I started actually with another lawyer uh, who was my opposing counsel on a deal that I worked on, one of the last deals at Davis and Gilbert, and she also wanted to travel. We started the site together, um, and she really didn't enjoy the writing. So what happened was I took over the writing, and she kept traveling, and I kept as well. Uh, so it sort of just turned into my site. Uh, we're still good friends. She's doing great, but it wasn't her thing, and she went back to New York after the year, what we had both planned to do. Obviously, <laughs> you I took did a not. different path. Then. Right, right, right. But when did you know, though, that hey, I might not be heading back to practice? I think probably in 2010 when uh, CNN Go, which is an arm of CNN in Asia, had approached me through my site to ask if I'd be interested in signing a one year freelancer contract to write about Asia for them. And it blew me away because it really wasn't, I had never contemplated freelance writing. I didn't say, you know, I really want to be a writer the ability to be able to sort of monetize these experiences in a thoughtful way was something I hadn't thought about in a long-term plan. And so I decided, at the, when I let out, when I quit my job originally, I said I'm not going to monetize Legal Nomads. I'm putting no ads, I'm putting no sponsorship. And I've kept that. It, there's nothing... Yeah, we, there's very little advertisement from what I can none. tell. There's none. Yeah, the only thing I make money on directly from the site is the book. And on that World Resources page, I have some Amazon affiliate links for products that I use in my travels uh, and that I say, you know, these are things I carry with me. And at the bottom, of course, there's a disclosure saying, I get a 4% to 7% kickback for this, but that's it. I've turned down all other ads and anything else. So I decided to see, you know, could I fund what I wanted to do by writing elsewhere? And since 2010, I've been receiving these great opportunities. I write for Singapore Airlines in-flight magazine about technology, um, write some food stuff in Asia as well, and then the book that came out in the fall, which was a wonderful culmination of all the things that I had discovered, because food really didn't figure prominently at all when I started. Um, it wasn't until a friend of mine was like, it's not normal that you choose cities to find a specific <laughs> soup that someone said, go eat this. Yeah. I was like, yes, it is. Everyone does this. And he was like, no, yeah. that's, that's not the case. <laughs> well, I want to get to food in a second because I know that sure. that's a big part of the it reason is. why you it travel. Is. But I'm curious about your ability to generate and earn income because um, you're obviously not making the same thing that you made at the firm. So no. do you have a set number of like, do you say I want to make X? Based on this, how are you able to sustain your, your travels in that way? Well, so there are two things. Number one is that it's very easy to base yourself in Southeast Asia and not have to have the same income that you would have here. Um, living most of the year in Southeast Asia allows me to maintain a cost of living that's quite low. So right now what I've done is I've basically set out some long-term partnerships with travel companies and other companies that I use anyhow and, and work with and would work with regardless of whether they were having me as a brand ambassador. So I work with a Canadian company called G Adventures. I had sent my cousins on trips from them you know, prior to becoming a travel blogger. When they approached me to be part of this sort of ambassadorship program they were putting together, it made perfect sense. Their values worked with the site that I was building. So I have a few uh, contracts like that. I do the writing off-site as well for the Singapore Airlines and everything else. So I basically budget, you know, based on knowing when I come back to South America, uh, to uh, North America in the summers, it's going to be a higher cost of living, obviously. And then in the winter times, I am able to save much more mm -hmm. when I'm back in Southeast Asia. And so Jody, have you literally traveled the world at this <laughs> point? Tell us about some of the places no, that you've been no, to. No, <laughs> it's, a, it's a misconception. Because I love food so much, I really want to scratch under the surface and stay put. So I... You know, the first year and a half, two years, we're backpacking, primarily running around from place to place and, and spending the time going a lot, the transportation. And I have a section on the site called 
adventures in transportation, mis misadventures in transportation because of all the crazy chicken and bus and boat rides and water buffalo everywhere. <laughs> and, and they're great fun. I mean, they're still, even when I base myself somewhere, those public transportation rides are those stories worth telling. Um, but what happened when I started really focusing on food is that I didn't want to move. I wanted to stay and really learn from vendors. Uh, and I started bringing people from uh, from hostels I was staying at and saying, I'll, I'll give you people here to eat if you let me stay for a week. Oh, and, okay. and I want to learn this one dish, teach me this dish. And they would say, oh, you're crazy, but sure, no problem. <laughs> okay. So uh, I started slowing down more and more and more. And now that food's really taken uh, prominence, I spend usually five to six months with a base somewhere in Southeast Asia. So it was Thailand for the last few years. And then the past January, I was in or December to April in Vietnam. Um, is Asia a place that you visit frequently because of the food, the culture, and people? There, so there's two reasons. One is the chaos and the food, and I, and I do love the fact that I'm sitting and having snails on the street at 3 in the morning with a few chickens milling around. You know, to me, <laughs> it's just that kind of chaos is wonderful. The other thing is I was diagnosed with celiac disease probably, I guess, 2002 when I was, 2001, 2002 when I was living in France. So now it's super trendy, but then... Well, I'm not exactly sure what that is. Can you explain? It's gluten-free, basically, but there's people who are sensitive to gluten and then people who have the disease, which is actually an autoimmune disease, not an allergy, um, and cannot digest gluten properly. So I was diagnosed about a decade ago, and as I've gotten older, I've had a harder and harder time with it. Now, if I use food that's been fried in oil that was used for breaded things, I can't, I can't, if you fry something for me, I'll still get sick. That's how sensitive I've, I've mm. become. So Asia's become a wonderful place because of the rice. And if you know what foods to avoid, uh, you're fine. So Vietnam specifically, you know, they use tapioca flour to thicken soups in the south and everything is rice and tapioca based. And I was on the phone with my parents like in tears. I can eat everything. <laughs> this is magic. It was so good for that reason. So uh, it's compelling reason to keep well, So tell us about growing up and the food that you had at home. I mean, did that also sort of stimulate or create this interest in food? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> my mother... Um, loves when I cook. She's not a fan of cooking and she's the first to say I really don't enjoy cooking at all. So she gave me use of the kitchen and I would experiment, but there was really no emphasis from my family on food. I think for me what happened was as I started traveling, I started looking at all the little things in the history of them and found that the things that people were writing about often were like the bigger sort of overarching fancy restaurants or the culinary trends. But what I was fascinated in was how people moving around affected uh, the way we eat. And that comes definitely from that historical background that my family kind of gave my brother and I um, as a curiosity. But it really wasn't until I got on the road that I started thinking about it and then seeing that food was this connective tissue that nothing else bridged in the way that food did. So is that the inspiration then for the Food Traveler's Handbook? My readers were the inspiration. <laughs> they were like, Jody, when are you writing a book? And I would go, seriously? <laughs> Me? All right. I, it basically came from them saying, we want to eat what you eat, but we're worried about dying of dysentery. Can you fix this for us? They were concerned. <laughs> Valid concern. Valid concern. I do have a post about getting sick around the world. Uh, There's like all the days of sickness, um, some definite interesting. I learned my lessons. This is what I tested it so you don't have to is the motto for the book. But the book includes not just, you know, how to find food on the street, but also safety tips like carrying your own Yeah, give us a couple of tips Well, there. I think sometimes the food itself is not the problem. It's the cutlery or how it's being washed. So I travel with my own portable chopsticks that, you know, you may get a funny look in, in washing them, using them on the street. But if you look at the cutlery and it seems problematic, it's a good idea to use. You know, you have this transparent kitchen in front of you and you're at a street stall. You can see how clean and dirty it is. If someone's touching the money with their hands and then and touching the food. And also touching the, the food, food, yeah. Right, little things like that. Um, when I, I say, if you don't bring your own chopsticks, bring wet wipes. So at least you could wash down the chopsticks with wet wipes if there's an issue or the spoon or the fork. Um, and I often say, you know, everyone says go to the lineups where there's lineups. If, you're, if there's a bunch of stalls at the lineup, the ones with more women, more children in them are often a better bet uh, because if people are bringing their kids there, it'll usually be a more trustworthy option. And I think you also said look for the universities in the town yes, because there are a lot of cheap, that. It's cheap fun. options. Yeah. They're not going to be your most gourmet options, but kids are hungry and they want, you know, home cooked food, natural food that they would have at home, some, you know, in the middle of the day. Of course, there's great junk food available too. 
that you probably wouldn't get a chance to see at fast food places, these strange amalgamations of different junk foods from different places. And one tip that's probably not in the book, but I think it's a good one, especially if you're traveling by yourself, you say that you have a, a, a doorstop? I do, that you keep yeah, with you I always you carry a doorstop and a safety whistle with me. Um, the safety whistle, you know, I wrote a post about it. I didn't want to make it. I'm a solo female traveler. I carry a whistle with me and just in case. So I, I talked about when it actually came in handy outside the general safety chips, which is I was chased up a hill by monkeys in Burma and I was, I was <laughs> walking up to try and I was going to sleep at a monastery by myself and um, I was carrying a blanket and the monkeys kept coming and trying to pull the blanket from me. and. It was getting out of hand, and I was like, I'm small, the mountain's tall, there are many monkeys, what am I going to do? And I just I had a safety whistle on the sternum strap for my backpack, and I just blew on it as hard as I could, and they freaked out and went <laughs> running back into the forest. I was like, bring your safety whistle, monkeys will Never know when you, you might need to exactly. escape monkeys. So. <laughs> exactly. Jody, finally, though, uh, you, your travel here now, do you think that it might lessen in the coming years, or might you continue on at the same pace? I don't. So the pace has changed, right, from the beginning, I think the worst thing you can do is sort of say, I'm going to do X and then never deviate from that plan. I never had a set plan when I set out other than I really wanted to see the world instead of just reading about it. Now it's become I want to eat the world as well as seeing mm -hmm. it. Um, and for me, you know, I'm going back to Vietnam in January. My readers have asked me to start food tours where uh, they want me to basically take them to the places that I love to eat. And I decided to do them by color. So it'll be red foods and green foods and that way to kind of bring different dishes together but by a theme and talk about how they came to Vietnam. So we'll see where it goes, to yeah. be honest. I mean, the, the winters in Asia, summers in North America has worked out really well. It's probably not a normal routine, but for <laughs> me it's become a routine. And I've just really enjoyed learning from the people I've met, learning from the foods that I've eaten. And, you know, if I decide I'm tired of it, then I'll come back. You'll do something That's else. That's right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today to talk about Thank your you. career. Thanks for having me. And the, her blog is called Legal Nomads. And uh, for more information on this or other topics, subscribe to BloombergLaw.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank